Thank you for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm John Carroll. Coming up, healing the wounds of war. A young man who lost his leg in Ukraine is now in San Diego regaining the ability to walk. A new generation of problem solvers. See the state-of-the-art building that's now home to future engineers on the UC San Diego campus. And the world said goodbye to Queen Elizabeth this week. We'll have a personal look back at her visit to one local church. We begin with two stories, both about the push and pull when it comes to finding ways to care for our homeless population. We'll check in on Oceanside, one of the cities getting money for a new shelter. But first, here's Matt Hoffman in El Cajon, where the mayor is not happy about where some people are ending up. They're intimidating private business owners, the, the owners of the hotels, uh, who voluntarily choose to participate in this program. Uh, and they're intimidating the residents, uh, you know, and, and it's just a really unfortunate time. Supervisor Nathan Fletcher says it's irresponsible for the city of El Cajon to try and limit the number of people in the county's hotel voucher program. He says 30 percent of the homeless residents have been connected to permanent housing. He's calling out El Cajon Mayor Bill Wells directly. If this goes through, I mean, if this goes through, the, the only the only outcome. Uh, of this will be hundreds of more homeless people in El Cajon and across East County. Um, and uh, and that's, a, that's a, a great disservice, not just to the unsheltered individuals, that's a disservice to every neighbor who's going to have these folks push back in their neighborhood. Wells pushes back against that and believes the county is sending too many people from outside the city to their hotels, which he says then creates public safety issues. I'm not working against anybody, I'm working for the people of El Cajon. You know, people, they elected me because they want me to protect their interests. Anecdotally, we're hearing there's a lot of people from outside of the East County area. So I, I'd be curious to get real hard numbers on those statistics. The county provided hard numbers, and they say 64% of the homeless in the voucher program are from El Cajon, with nearly 100% from the East County area. They didn't have a problem with it over, for over the last year. This program's over a year old, but only now do they have a problem. Wells says they aren't kicking anyone out, despite telling hotels to reduce capacity and issuing them notices with potential fines for illegally operating as shelters. We cited people for that, but frankly, we're working with people. I don't think we're going to end up finding anybody. They just have to comply with having less than 25 percent. Wells says at least one of the hotels was nearly completely full and he just wants more communication about what's happening. People using the vouchers say they are a lifesaver, especially those like local resident Don Disney, who is diabetic. I have to take insulin now and you have to keep it cold. It has to be in the refrigerator. So you need it. I need, I, I can't be outside, you know, so it's just frustrating. But why would you not want your, why would you not want hotels to be helping homeless people. Wells says he thinks a compromise can be found. County and El Cajon officials have another meeting to discuss the program later this week. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. A handful of cities are getting money to pay for their homeless outreach, and the county says there are millions still up for grabs. KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne shows what Oceanside is doing with some of that cash. Earlier this year, the county offered $10 million in grants to cities for projects tackling homelessness. When I introduced this, I thought we'd get 30 or $40 million of requests. And we didn't. We only got requests for half of the funding that we had available. But county supervisor Nathan Fletcher says only three cities applied. These three cities in San Diego County, I want to applaud them because talking about homelessness and complaining about homelessness is easy. But actually stepping up to find a location, to find a facility, to do the hard, difficult work to get people off the streets and get them help, that's to be commended. He awarded $3 million today toward Oceanside's first homeless shelter. To be here today with Oceanside and to celebrate their willingness to step forward and be a part of the solution is something that we really need to do. And our county will continue to push and to lead and to work and to do more. Oceanside's 50-bed homeless shelter is still under construction. Oceanside Mayor Esther Sanchez says grant money is what has helped pay for the remodel of the site, 
that was estimated at $3 million and is now up to $6.7 million. So this is really, really helping us to make this dream, really, of our community make it happen. Um, we are hoping to be uh, up in Adam by uh, the beginning of next year. Vista and San Diego are the other two cities that got grants. We're also awarding the city of Vista $65,000 for their safe parking lot program. Uh, 25 vehicle safe parking lot that will be open early next year and the city of San Diego about a million dollars for a safe parking program. They'll operate a 60 vehicle safe parking lots. Fletcher says he is re-inviting cities to step up and apply for the five million that is still up for grabs. There's not a single city in San Diego County that's not struggling with homelessness. There's not one. And, and we know it's hard and it's difficult and whatever you do, someone's going to oppose. Invariably, folks are going to oppose this being here. But you've got to get past that. You've got to get focused on how do we find a solution. The grants are intended to get programs started. Each city is pitching in its own funds to keep the programs going. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. Our coverage this week includes insight from some of the top local reporters covering homelessness. That's the focus for this week's KPBS Roundtable podcast. It's available on all major podcast platforms and at kpbs.org. With gas prices rising again, stories about alternative energy are getting a lot of attention at kpbs.org. Some of our most popular this week include the state's work to potentially phase out gas furnaces and water heaters in homes. Also, Eric Anderson's report on electric vehicles, the demand for more charging stations, and what that means for our electricity grid. And the story of Mexico's surfing history is finally being told. We'll have that one for you a bit later in this newscast. Our next story includes the first steps for a Ukrainian teenager who lost his leg to war thousands of miles away. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado shows us the work being done here in San Diego to heal his body and mind. Just do a deep breath and relax. These are 16-year-old Ivan Chaban's first steps on his new prosthetic leg. And you can walk a little quicker if he likes. Why is not it stretch the extra arches? Excellent. Beautiful. He's taking them in Mira Mesa with prosthetist Peter Harsh. But Ivan's home is a world away in Sumy, Ukraine, where he lives with his mother, two sisters and two brothers. That's where almost six months ago, his life changed forever. About a month after the Russian invasion, he, his mother and stepfather were returning home from the grocery store when the evils of war struck their family. <laughs> Uh, as they were returning, he said, a column of uh, enemy Russian uh, vehicles uh, caught up to them, approached them. One of the tanks actually veered away from the column and uh, went directly towards them. And as the tank approached, uh, the other two were sort of shoved away and in injured, and in his case, uh, the tank got him under the tracks. Ivan's stepfather died in the attack. His mother survived, but Ivan lost part of his leg. Through it all, he still smiles. I had a very positive attitude. His whole uh, reaction was, I want to live. The Ukrainian embassy in Washington, D.C., partnered with the San Diego-based Right to Walk Foundation to bring Ivan to the U.S. A family friend who came with Ivan says he wants to be fully mobile again to provide for his family. Life even up to this point was not easy for Ivan. Uh, uh, a large family uh, without a father. He is not uh, in any way negative or, or uh, sorry for himself. He is charging forward. And charging forward, he is. Go, go, go. Yep. Keep going, keep going. Push through. Yep. Go, go, go. Yep, yep. Look up. Nice and tall. Yep. 
There you go. Push, get those muscles going. Harsh says this journey won't be easy. Ivan will be here for the next three months, where he starts a foundation he can build on. And this place is different. They don't just work on the physical. It's also the emotional stuff. As they're sitting here waiting, thinking about the family back home, what happened to them, is that we pick them back up so they can go again to the next level. Anybody can make Yvonne walk, but can they take them to the next level, the level they need to really go back and do their life? This is what people need to think about, and this is not easy. But even Harsh is impressed with Yvonne's first day on his prosthetic leg. He'd only been measured for it the day before. Does he want one more? What's your status? Back, back. Feel good to walk? Ask him. What's your status? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he can send it back to his mom and tell her he's walking. Second day. Ivan has big dreams. Uh, go to Hollywood. Uh, yeah. Uh, be an actor. Right. With your optimism and your courage, I think you can do anything you want to do. Dream big. Ivan still needs a local host family to help him through his recovery so he can make his dream a reality. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. Prosthetics are just one of the many inventions that are perfected by the science of engineering. UC San Diego now has a new state-of-the-art home where the next great minds are getting their start. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez takes us there. So I might represent a remote student um, attending school virtually. That's Alex Chow, a graduate student at UC San Diego, working on his master's degree in computer science. He's actually 100 miles away at home in Riverside, remotely operating a new robot that's in development on the campus in La Jolla. So with this robot, um, you could you know, move the robot around like so, uh, turn around the environment, grab stuff with the arm and the gripper, and basically interact with your, with your classmates uh, to get a more immersive experience of school while you're at home. Chow is one member of a team of UCSD graduate students experimenting with this bionic simulated person that could someday soon help children with special needs. Pratusha Gosh is also on the team doing research for her PhD dissertation. If they're unable to physically attend school, then they may be able to use this robot to actually actively participate in school as a robot. This group project is happening on the second floor of the brand new Franklin Antonio Hall, named after the late Qualcomm co-founder who was a UCSD graduate. Antonio donated 30 million of the 180 million dollars it costs to construct the four-story state-of-the-art building designed by engineers to house the next generations of engineers. We're bursting at the seams. Albert Pisano was a good friend of Franklin Antonio. He is also the dean of the UC San Diego Jacobs School of Engineering, which has reached a record enrollment of almost 10,000 students. This new building makes room for growth and brings students, professors, researchers, and industry leaders together under one solar-powered roof. When you sit in this building, you are simultaneously motivated to look out and to work within, to collaborate and to think big thoughts independently. The building is divided into more than a dozen collaboratories, labs with collaboration going on every day on every floor. Right now we're working on a home robot that can take your groceries and put them away. Henrik Christensen is director of robotics. He teaches and mentors mechanical and electrical engineering students, and also those who are working on degrees in computer science, who design software to make the magic happen. Now I get to have them all in the same space, and this makes a big difference for them to talk to each other, to really understand how can they complement each other on building products we've never seen before. It isn't your grandfather's engineer anymore, I can assure you that. In the past 10 years, Pisano and his team have led the Jacobs School into the top 10 engineering universities in the country. He says the new home that was built on what used to be a parking lot will keep the school in the top 10 housing research in artificial intelligence, development of powerful long-lasting batteries for electric cars, 
and this. Making thin film sensors, even less intrusive than a Band-Aid, that not only can understand what's going on with your metabolism, but be powered by the very sweat that your skin exudes. No batteries. Try to move the robot towards the target. The learning curve and vibe running through Antonio Hall is just getting started as unpacking and setup continues. There is no social distancing here. Engineers are working side by side and face to face. As the saying goes, if you build it, they will come. And they have. Cedric Girard is a postdoctorate engineer from Lyon, France, working on a device that will make colonoscopies much more comfortable. Professors are closer to each other in this space, so it's easier for discussions. It's, uh, I think it creates a more dynamic environment for collaborations. Pisano has the welcome mat out. The world is filled with issues that need to be addressed now. A workable solution now is better than a perfect solution later. So the future is now, and it's happening in real time. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. Kids in East County are now getting to class in zero emission buses. There's also a brand new maintenance yard to protect that investment in green energy. Jacob Ayer shows us how it's part of a larger strategy to rethink transportation at our schools. A ribbon cutting ceremony was held to celebrate Grossmont Union High School District's new transportation services center. The 32,000 square foot facility includes nine bus maintenance bays, a drive through bus wash, and extensive parts storage. Mary Beth Kasten is the superintendent of the district. This relentless commitment to resource conservation across the district saves more than $2 million in annual energy costs. The $24 million center also features cutting edge automotive maintenance and safety technology, new tools, training, bus dispatch, and administrative support offices. And all that money that's being saved by using electric buses instead of diesel ones is going back to the students in the district. Sophia Romeo is part of the district's engineering and architecture pathway in the career and technical education program. So we work with a lot of uh, computer program robots and a lot of those supplies are a lot of money where a lot of times if we do not get the grant for it, if we do not get the money for it, we don't do it. So I'm really like happy to know that next year, uh, the students that are going to be in my pathway get to experience a lot of things that I could not experience because we did not have the funding for. The Transportation Services Center will start by running 17 electric buses. That's the first phase of the district's plan to replace 67 diesel-fueled buses over the next 20 years. Brooklyn Price is another student in the district's CTE program who says the new center is inspiring her peers to pursue careers in renewable energy. Right now, we have multiple programs at multiple schools to teach everybody about green energy and all the renewable sources that will help benefit us in the future and stop greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gases. And one more step towards sustainability, rooftop solar to harness renewable energy for the facility's operations. The district will charge its buses during school hours when there is a strong solar power generation and overnight at super off peak times for the power grid. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. Quite a moment last weekend for women's sports, not just in San Diego, but in the U.S. The San Diego Waves sold out the brand new Snapdragon Stadium. More than 32,000 fans set a new attendance record for the National Women's Soccer League. The Wave won their match thanks to a save from goalkeeper Kaylin Sheridan, who was named the league's Player of the Week. For those catching a wave in Baja, it all starts in Ensenada. The beach town is the birthplace of Mexican surfing. KPBS border reporter Gustavo Solis caught up with those who are working to preserve and spread that history. The Baja coast has always had amazing waves. But when Ignacio Felix was growing up in Ensenada during the 1960s, surfboards were a rare commodity. Felix was among a group of curious children who spent hours at the beach just sitting there on the sand watching the surfers catch waves. As he grew older, Felix's curiosity turned into a passion, and he became one of the original co-founders of the Baja Surf Club, which was the first official club in Mexican history. 
He remembers being totally starstruck when surfing legends he'd only seen on magazine pages came to Ensenada for a contest that he helped organize. Comienzan a llegar figuras como Mike Doyle, eh, Mickey Muñoz, David Nueva, hasta Mickey Dora llegó. By the time Pete Torres first picked up a board in the 1970s, surfing was becoming more popular in Mexico, but it still had a stigma. He says that it was mostly associated with long hair, hippies, and drugs. Si tú le decías a tu mamá, voy a empezar a surfear, tu mamá, no, es un deporte de vagos, son marihuana, o sea, era muy mal visto. Mexico has thousands of miles of coastline and several world-class surf spots. Thanks to these natural gifts, it also has a rich surf history, full of adventurers who discovered new waves and evangelized the sport down the country's Pacific coast. They also fought a federal government that didn't want them around. But that rich history is not well known. Torres and Jesus Salazar are trying to change that. They started documenting the origins of Mexican surfing through a podcast and Instagram page called Memorabilia del Surfing Mexicano. And that's like the main objective, you know, like to talk about uh, surfing culture, Mexican surfing culture, and to start to give it uh, an identity to Mexican surf, because there is none. The project has taken them to famous beaches of Mazatlán, Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Nayarit. They've tracked down historic photographs and interviewed the pioneers of Mexican surfing. It's amazing to see, to hold the history in your hands, you know. Torres and Salazar say that one of the most important moments in Mexican surf history happened in 1970. Felix and other members of the Baja Surf Club performed well at the 1968 World Championships in Puerto Rico. They put on a bid to host a tournament in 1970. Against all odds, they were awarded the bid ahead of surfing heavyweights like Australia and South Africa. Felix says nobody expected them to actually get the world championship. The governor of Baja California and the mayor of Ensenada just couldn't believe it. La cara de ellos fue que, ah, caray, como que nos apoyaron creyendo que éramos, eh, pues, unos chamacos que estaban medio locos, que no íbamos a traer nada, y de pronto aquí está el mundial. Órale. The event was going to put Mexican surfing on the map. But the cultural upheaval of the late 1960s was in full swing. Woodstock had just made international headlines. The Mexican government wasn't interested in a south-of-the-border version of that chaotic scene. So they canceled the contest. But the gobierno mexicano said, no queremos que Ensenada se convierta en un lugar en donde los hippies de California vengan y lo adopten. But that decision derailed the development of competitive surfing in Mexico. Mexican surfers would not go to another world championship until 1988, the year Torres was on the team. Salazar says that it's very important for those who live the history to tell their own stories. Americans have come a lot and, and made, they make all uh, kinds of stories about surfing in Mexico and they tell very little about Mexicans. And we feel it's important to get uh, stories about Mexicans out there. And their efforts are starting to pay off. Salazar and Torres helped research an article on Acapulco surf culture for the latest edition of the Surfer's Journal. They see that collaboration with one of the biggest surfing magazines in the world as recognition of the important work that they're doing. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. The events surrounding Queen Elizabeth's death and funeral stirred memories for a few of us here in San Diego. Memories of the weekend in February of 1983 when she visited America's finest city. She attended morning service at what is now St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral and I had the honor and pleasure of being there. Here's my remembrance of that day. February 27, 1983 was a day that followed months of planning. Tickets that went primarily to members of St. Paul's were required to attend the service. I was fortunate I didn't need a ticket because my father, the Reverend James Carroll, was rector of St. Paul's at that time. The months of anticipation culminated that morning. Everyone had gone through a metal detector and was seated. The first thing I heard were the news helicopters. And this was what was happening outside. The Queen and Prince Philip, along with Secret Service and lots of staff, pulling up to the church. I can honestly say the mood was electric. Before I knew it, my dad was escorting the Queen into the church. No cameras were allowed inside. It was all over in a flash. Dad then escorted the queen back out, where a young member of St. Paul's gave her a bouquet. 
Then she and Philip got back into the limousine. They waited until Scottish dancers finished their performance and they were off. An enormous amount of preparation went into this, so we wanted things to go right. That's my father after the service. I'd describe him as happy and deeply relieved. Afterward, Channel 10's Leonard Villarreal asked him if he ever thought he'd preach a sermon to the Queen. I fantasized about preaching in St. Paul's Cathedral, London, and I, that never happened, probably never will, but this was better. <laughs> Elements that were important in any given time um, are the things we try to retain. John Will is St. Paul's archivist. He has a special area dedicated just to the Queen's visit. We have the uh, actual uh, prayer service in here, as well as a number of photographs. There is another reminder of the Queen's visit. It's found inside the church. Where there were once pews, there are now chairs. My family and I sat in this row on that day. One very special pew remains, this one, and the fact it's draped in black probably gives you a clue of what it is. Sure enough, here is a plaque that commemorates. This is where Queen Elizabeth and her husband, Prince Philip, sat on that very special day. Back outside, another tangible reminder. Not long after that day, this space was renamed in honor of the Queen's visit. It's now the Queen's courtyard, and here is the plaque commemorating her visit. It's not just at St. Paul's where memories of the Queen are strong. They're never far off here in my family home either, where pictures of Dad and the Queen have been up here in the hallway literally for decades. But there is one more picture I want to show you, and it's in the living room. It's here on the piano. We got this a couple of months after the visit, a personally signed picture by the Queen and Prince Philip. An amazing way to remember a truly amazing day. John Carroll, KPBS News. Oh, all those years ago. You can find that story and all of our content at the KPBS YouTube page. That's where we also live stream KPBS Evening Edition weeknights at 5. We hope you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm John Carroll. Thank you for joining us.